Please listen carefully. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 17th episode of the Study Space Podcast, a show dedicated to helping students like you earn better grades, navigate your college journey, and become lifelong learners. My name is David, content strategist at Uniplan. And my name is Julian, the founder and lead software engineer at Uniplan. Today, we'll be talking about academic dishonesty in the age of remote learning. Uh, but before we start, I have to ask, Julian, what's inspiring you today? Well, something that has been inspiring me lately is uh, a habit that I, I guess I, I picked up again in recent times, and, and I only noticed that it's been helping me in another area of my life, and that's reading. Uh, I, I recently picked up uh, reading recreationally, recently, relatively recently. I guess I, I picked up, let's see here. So, so, I mean, if you want to go really like way back, I started listening to this audiobook in, uh, in, in the summer of last year. So like August, September-ish, I listened to an audiobook. It's called The the death of mrs westaway it's a very very good book actually it's a kind of like a mystery uh mystery thriller uh, non-fiction book uh, I, I forget the author but but uh, it, it's a really really good book and i and i i listened to that um on my walks when i went to work so um i think i mentioned before that i i i do intermittent fasting so i skip lunch uh, when I go to work and um, but my company still mandates that I take a lunch hour so what I do is I filled that time with uh, listening to this audiobook and after I finished it I was like okay well I don't really have anything else to listen to so um, you know some time passed and I, I, I found another book and that's called Mistborn and I, I, I have mentioned Mistborn before as one of my inspirations and luckily for me, it's a series of books. It's not just one book. So I read the first book, then it led to the second, and it led to the third. And the third was the finale of the first like era of the whole story. And then there's a second era where it's like a it's like a time gap, like a time jump forward. And I started reading those series. Um, and uh, I finished the I finished the first and second book. I am on the third book now, and the the fourth and last book in this era is slated to be released in 2021. I think. Uh, hopefully, it comes out by then because I feel like if I read if I finish this third book, it's going to be really hard for me to wait for the very last book because events are ramping up right now. But anyway, so. Obviously, I've built up this sort of cadence of reading, right? I read, let's see here, one, two, three, four, five, six books. Six books I've actually read and in one book I, I listened to over the summer. Um, and that's that's pretty great, I think, considering that like prior to that, I, I virtually never read recreationally. I don't know if like how long has it been, David, since you read like a book just for fun? <clears throat> this is going to surprise you, but it was literally in middle school, so... How long ago was that? Four or five years? Yeah, five years now. Yeah. So yeah, I read um the last book I read. I, I I can remember it. That's like how little I started reading after high school. I read Jurassic Park in um in in middle school and then I just stopped like reading because I mean, for one, like I don't I don't I didn't have any time. Um but I guess that's just kind of an excuse, um, because I was able to find time to do other things like, you know, play video games or whatever. Um I guess it just didn't interest me anymore, and there was like this expectation that you had to read like adult books now, which are mainly like nonfiction, um, and that those books like do not interest me. I've bought a few of those, and they're just pretty boring to me. So if I did if I did get back into reading, I'd start reading fiction again. But yeah, yeah, and 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 you know what? I don't blame you because let's be honest, games are much more compelling than books, right? So yeah. so I don't blame you at all. Um, but but. I guess I guess the 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 real inspiration here is that I've sort of built up this cadence and habit of reading again, and I've noticed that it's it it has really allowed me to focus a lot more when I'm reading textbooks, right? 
Um, I, I in in my in my previous class in computer networks, I I didn't read the textbook that much. I only read the textbook when I felt there was a large gap in my knowledge that would not be filled if um, yeah you know I I was afraid that the gap in my knowledge would affect me negatively on exams and in projects. Considering I had never taken an undergraduate level course in it before, so I felt worried that I wasn't prepared. So I wanted to read everything, and so. Uh, but even then, I didn't really read the textbook like chapter to chapter. I, I basically found the part that I wanted to read about and then read about that um, on its own. So it was pretty much self-contained reading. But in in this class, the 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 information security class that I'm taking, the textbook is actually very very heavily used. Um, and in fact, I I just took one of the quizzes for the the uh, lecture content. And it turns out that uh, a great deal of the questions on that quiz were not from lecture. They were for actually from the reading. So uh, fortunately, I was able to do very, very well on the quiz because I was actually reading the textbook following along um, with the schedule that is recommended by the, the professor. So, um, so I've been reading. And, and you know what? I'm going to be honest. Reading textbooks is dry, you know? But... But after sort of developing, developing that cadence of, of reading recreationally, I found that once I sat down with my textbook, I was able to just sit there and be able to focus and read for a, a more extended period of time, let's say. You know, I'm not going to read like a whole chapter, you know, in one sitting because it's like 40, 50 pages per chapter. And it's a really, it's really technical uh, difficult stuff to, to read. So it's not really the most uh, compelling. It's not a story necessarily. It's information. So you can imagine like 40, 50, 60 pages of just straight up information is not gonna, you know, I, I can't go through that like a, like a, like a recreational fiction fantasy novel. Right. But still I'm able to sit down and read my textbooks for longer periods of time. And I'm, that's a good thing because I can just get through my reading and, uh, I'm, I'm better off for it. So, uh, I, I realize this is a long segment, but, um, that's my inspiration is that I've developed a cadence of reading and it has improved my ability to just sort of sit there and focus on my reading, which has benefited me in my classes. And, and that is what is inspiring me today. Yeah, that's definitely a good point. I, I really do need to get back into reading. I know that I think in our age group, like people just kind of fall out of reading. There are still some people who are, you know, very good with books and everything. But I guess most of us just don't either don't find time to or they don't we don't find it important enough to read. But that's a really good point. Like it can translate into actually, you know, benefiting you in your classes and whatnot. So, yeah, it's a good and point. I think. I think that's just a consequence of being forced to read a bunch of stuff that we don't want to read as, yeah. as you know, kids, that's, that's right? Funny, yeah. And and so so once you sort of get over that mental hurdle of like, oh, I, I'm actually not forced to read anything that I don't want to read anymore, you know? And once you get over mm -hmm. that mental hurdle and you find a book that seems interesting to you and you actually make the effort to sort of sit down and start reading and you actually end up liking what you're reading then you just sort of stick with it and it feels like a netflix episode of a really good show in your head and you know and the best part is you fill it with the imagination that that that's your own right and i think that's the best part so yeah, i think that is once, true. once i thought about it yeah once i thought about it and i was like oh like i'm not really being forced to read this i'm sort of reading this on my own time and i actually really do enjoy this story because the author is so good brandon sanderson is the author of mistborn and he authors a bunch of other books too in the fantasy realm and it's it's so good he is so talented and wonderful he just simply is a legendary writer like i i i I have a lot to say about Brandon Sanderson. He's just an excellent author, but uh, I'll, I'll let you get to your part now. Yeah, so what's inspiring me today is um, in a week, there's actually going to be a SpaceX launch, and this is going to be a very special launch because it's the first time that SpaceX is actually going to launch crew, um, and they're going to launch them to the ISS, which is the International Space Station. Um, and I think two astronauts, I forget their names, um, but two American astronauts are going to be launched in American rockets from American soil. <laughs> that's the um, that's what Jim Bridenstine, the director of NASA, has been using as like kind of a marketing phrase for 
this demonstration mission. But it's going to be very interesting to see Americans, you know, finally getting back um, into space because we've been launching from Russian rockets actually for the last, I don't know how many decades, but ever since the, um, the sh space shuttle um, missions basically shut down, um, we've been launching from Russian rockets ever since. So this will be really interesting to see. I'm excited um, as someone who wants to work, um, you know, for either SpaceX or NASA or or something related to aerospace in the future. This is this is really exciting news, but and just for space nerds in general, I guess. Nice, really, really nice. Yeah, I remember when I was interning at NASA, we would watch SpaceX launches because just launches in general are just really awesome to watch. You know, like it it. it it floors me still to this day every time when I see anybody on planet Earth launching something that reaches space. It's just astounding because if you really think about it, there are very, very, very few people relative to the entire world population that ever get to experience that. And that fact alone blows my mind. Like it, it I just get floored. So yeah i remember watching spacex launches at nasa on the big screen and we would cheer we would clap at every success because it's just uh just an astounding achievement every time every time yeah they're they're so like the thing is with these launches they're so frequent and regular now that we kind of take it for granted but this wasn't it wasn't always like this um there was a there was a period of time when there were like no launches you know no launches at least that were viewed by um, by like general audiences because SpaceX actually developed a really good system for us to kind of watch launches. But um, before then, you know, we couldn't actually see um, a view from the rocket or like as soon as it broke some some height in the atmosphere, we basically disappeared. It basically disappeared and we couldn't see it anymore. But SpaceX was able to develop this sort of um, this imaging. I don't want to. I don't know what to call it even, um, but yeah video imaging i guess that that's what you would call it but um now we can view all these space flights and they do so many a year i, I want to say it's like dozens every year which is which is so much compared to what we used to do um it's becoming a regular thing which is which is really interesting and i think um elon musk has announced many plans to start taking passengers up in within the next few years so that should be exciting to see you know um making space more available for people yeah, and and I mean SpaceX has really democratized uh, watching launches. Like they certainly did a great job at live streaming those events. They have speakers that sort of televise and narrate what's going on for for the general populace, and I think that's great. Uh, and and you know it's, you, you just basically all you need to do is just click on a link, and then there you go. You're you're watching a live launch, right? And that, I just think that's totally awesome that we able that we're able to to do that now yeah uh, for anyone who wants to watch the launch um it's going to be next week on um the 27th of may i don't know if we're going to get the episode up before that happens but we um, should be but hopefully if if there's a if there's a recording somewhere you guys can watch that too but it's going to be at a 4 30 um eastern standard time i believe on wednesday next week so it should be exciting to see. It's gonna be a, it's gonna be a milestone for sure. Certainly. All right. So I guess uh, if you want to get into the episode, um, Julian, you have some points to make. Yeah, sure. So the the topic of today's episode is is one of my choosing. I, I have to admit that. Um, so uh, what I wanted, the reason why I wanted to do this episode is because I got an email. Because uh, I'm a I'm a student of of Georgia Tech technically, um, only technically, because I, I have never actually once stepped foot on campus, but oh well. Um, I got an email from Georgia Tech detailing a sort of town hall event, which we will link in the show notes. It's a town hall where uh, s uh, several professors, uh, faculty and staff within Georgia Tech uh, and, and it was a virtual town hall, obviously, given the pandemic going around, in which everybody talked about academic integrity, right? And, and David said at the beginning of the episode that we're going to be talking about academic integrity, 
academic dishonesty in the age of remote learning. And why is that? Well, I think this is pretty obvious for everybody, but I guess to reiterate for, for future listeners going backwards and, and listening to older episodes, the, the coronavirus pandemic has forced universities virtually across the country, and, and let's be honest, the entire world, to, to close their doors and transition to remote learning or distance learning. And this fact of remote learning or distance learning has brought up you know, very obviously concerns within the academia community regarding cheating, academic dishonesty and integrity uh, and other infractions upon academic integrity. And, and these main concerns are usually about, you know, the fact that we're not in class anymore. So there's no direct physical oversight of students during exams or, you know, essays or, or such like, right? Uh, and, and, and the fact that distance learning sort of depends on digital tools like laptop computers and the internet and, you know, a bunch of other applications, this fact worries a great many educators about the possibility of cheating and academic dishonesty being involved within the academic community and within education. So first of all, um, I just kind of want to hear your thoughts on how there was literally a town hall being held with a bunch of faculty and staff within a, a, a very uh, prominent university, let's say, in the United States about academic integrity. Just wanted to know your thoughts about that. I think it's an extremely important discussion to have. I mean, um, you know, you, you transition from something like traditional learning where, you know, you have like a, a very organized um, structure that they've been doing for you know, years, decades, um, perhaps. And I, I think that the transition is, is something that we none of us expected, obviously. And um, I think there does need to be discussion because we can't just have, you know, every test be open book exam and say, okay, you can use whatever resources you, you want to because obviously like we can't stop you, right? And then and just have that and then obviously compromise um, the student's ability to learn because that leads to, you know, people just Googling answers or using Chegg or, or whatever, using whatever they can. And they're not really digesting the information the same way they would if the class was in person. Um, so there has to be some sort of compromise, right? Saying, okay, no, we're, we're not gonna, you know, we're not gonna do this course exactly the same way we're doing it in person. Like we can't possibly monitor all these students at once and make sure that, you know, and, and just kind of invade their privacy, which is what actually a student was bringing up in the middle of um, a classroom discussion because the professor was actually talking about how he wanted to use, um, I think it was a lockdown browser, Respondus, I believe that's what it's called. Yeah, and, SJSU uses Respondus. Yeah, and he was like, Respondus, and we he actually opted in for the webcam option. He said, I want everybody to do a little practice exam doing this. And we all did it, um, but it was terrible. Like, everybody was complaining about it after, and he was like, okay, so what do you guys think? And we all hated it. So he said, okay, fine, like, we'll just do an open book midterm, and that's whatever. But then, obviously, there's a problem with that, because for the open book midterm, I think the average was like a 96, which is ridiculous. Like Yikes. absolutely, absolutely ridiculous. Because we could, you, you could already tell that even though on the on the um, front of the test he said um, no collaboration, there was obviously collaboration. Like come on, and even if there wasn't any collaboration, we were still able to use YouTube and our textbooks and everything else. So all these online resources. So it's kind of hard not to get a 96, you know, like when you have all those materials available, even if even if you didn't get help from your friends, which I know a lot of people did, right? Um, so that's a problem. That's a problem, right? And obviously now these kids are going to go and be like, okay, well, I got like I, I passed, you know, differential equations. Luckily, our school has um, universal pass fail. So it's actually not as bad. Like you're not getting a free A, uh, but you're still, you know, getting a free pass. And so that, that causes a lot of problems because then, you know, what if you have another class in the future and that uses differential equations and you didn't actually learn differential equations. So when you go into that class, you're like, oh crap, like I didn't pay attention during that unit of differential equations. I just used YouTube and, and Chegg or whatever while I was doing the test. So obviously that causes problems and you, ha you haven't learned the material you're supposed to. So there has to be some sort of compromise. And I think that 
a town hall or some sort of discussion is necessary in order to discuss possible solutions. Um, you can't have everything be open book and you can't have everything be, you know, the same way it is in the classroom. So how can we strike a reasonable balance, you know, given the circumstances and how can we make sure that students are, are learning, but at the same time, you know, um, they're not like being put on, on absolute lockdown and just having their privacy invaded on and, and not being able to, to, I don't know. I don't even know. Feel comfortable in their own homes. That that's literally what people are saying. So, I'm just yeah. And and, and you bring up a, a a lot of a lot of good points here. There there are multiple sort of perspectives to this, right? One is that you're if if you allow open book, open notes, open whatever, right? That means you're you're opening up a whole really a whole can of worms about the kind of digital tools that are available in modern day. And you bring up Chegg, um, and in addition to Chegg, there are a variety of other like tutoring uh, and homework helping websites that have unfortunately been misused as a platform for cheating. Yep. Right? Like like I, I have literally seen um, whole assignments being posted on Chegg and, and somebody actually does like answer them. And actually uh, I've read over like the first answer cause Chegg it's, it's like a premium sort of thing. Right. So you have to pay to get full access, but I seen the, I've seen the first like answer and, and actually the, the, the answer I read was quite inaccurate, but that's, that's like a whole other thing. So there are all, there are all these like tutoring and homework helping websites that have been used for cheating and that's a concern right but on the flip side from the student's perspective there's the concern of privacy right you said that uh, your school was using the respondus lockdown browser to uh, basically remotely proctor exams and that involves turning on the webcam and recording the student taking the exam and if there are any sort of suspicious behaviors then that gets flagged and you know the student gets in trouble blah 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 right yeah, so yep. you, you know the deal so right so then now there are all of these sort of remote distance learning uh proctoring tools that have proliferated in the academic community because of the virus because that's there, there's an obvious need to 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 maintain academic integrity when students are taking exams from home right so you bring up a lot of good points and and we're gonna we're gonna touch on all of those points today uh things like the digital tools that are available and also uh privacy concerns from the student's perspective right we're gonna be talking about all of those things today what i i want to talk about first is is the reasoning behind students choosing to cheat at all right that that's just that's in academic vernacular you know academic dishonesty and it's, those are big words let's just call it cheating right cheating why do students cheat dr david joiner he is a very very popular professor within the online masters in computer science program for a very good reason. His classes are super organized, like very, very organized. Uh, you, you, you literally can't get lost in his classes because they're just so well put together, so well organized. The TAs are on point always. Um, and, and, and to no surprise uh, for anyone really, Dr. David Joyner, he started as a professor and then now he's literally the executive director of online education and OMSCS at Georgia Tech. Okay, he he got promoted this term actually, or uh, in the previous term over the uh, the spring semester. So he, Dr. Joyner, was at this town hall at Georgia Tech, and and this is a direct quote from him. He says, "Misconduct is mostly either opportunistic or due to desperation rather than an advanced intention." Right, and and uh, end quote, um, and and what he means is pressure stress, right? All of these things can add to the desperation of a student and this can motivate certain students to cheating. And also if, um, you know, given uh, the ease of a cheating opportunity, like if, if you do a sort of cost benefit analysis in your head really quick and say, oh, well, uh, the 
the professor is not watching me. There are no proctoring tools being used on me right now. So what stops me from cheating right now? So if it's easy and you think that you won't get caught, then you'll probably do it, right? So it's either opportunistic or it's due to desperation rather than an advanced intention. Like you don't, you don't go into a class with the explicit intention to cheat the entire way through. You don't walk into a degree intending to cheat your way through a degree, right? And that makes sense, right? Well, like, what, what do you think about that, first of all? Do you think Dr. Joyner is correct in, in thinking that cheating is either uh, an opportunistic thing or a desperation thing? Or, or is he wrong thinking that? Do you think that students literally do intend to cheat through everything? I definitely agree with his statement. I mean, I'm sure that a lot of the people, like, in my, for example, just for example, um, my differential equations class, I'm sure they didn't intend to like, you know, use the, use the, the pandemic and use the, um, coronavirus to, you know, be able to cheat like this, but it happened, right? And it happened because, um, their circumstances, I think just made it very convenient, very convenient to do so. You have all the tools at your disposal. Um, the professor isn't saying that you can't, right? So, so why not, right? Why not like do that? And why not just violate the one rule that he has, which is you can't collaborate with others too. I mean, how is he going to know, right? Does, does he like, <clears throat> he's not going to go out and like track your phone and, and look at all your messaging apps and make sure that you're not sending PDFs to other people or answers, you know, that's, that's not like, that's just not something the professor can do. So why not just cross that extra line too, since everything else is, is pretty much available. So I really, I really don't think that I really don't think the students came in wanting to do that. I don't think anybody came in wanting to get, you know, wanting to get good grades in all their classes using these methods. I mean, my university is, like I said, is, is pass fail, but I know that a lot of schools are doing graded systems too, and people are using these exact same strategies. So they are getting free A's essentially, but I don't think, I don't think they're like rubbing their hands together and saying, ha ha, you know, I'm getting, I'm getting a free A out of this. And this is like, so, con this is so like, this is so great. I'm going to take advantage of this. I think it's more of like, well, we're in a lockdown. I'm having a lot of trouble um, studying and doing things. And, you know, I don't have the traditional resources like office hours or, or tutoring sessions that I used to have. So might as well just, you know, take the opportunities that are, that are most convenient for me and just go ahead and, and basically cheat or, you know, misconduct. That's, that's what he calls it. But yeah, no, I, I definitely agree with his statement. I, I don't think that students, you know, had had the intention to do this at, like at the beginning. I think it just it ended up developing into this, which is, you know, a problem obviously, and we have to deal with it somehow, but yeah. Yeah, and I, I think I largely agree with Dr. Joyner here too. I mean, um, yeah, particularly in master's degrees, but, but really le bachelor's degrees too. The higher you go in, in, the, in a field of study, the harder the, the, diff the, the harder the material is going to be to understand, right? So if you, even if you do intend to cheat your way through a, a class, like you, you walk into a class, you sign up for a class with the intent to cheat your way through the entire thing, that, that's going to help for one class. Now replicate that across your entire program. Like, is that, is that feasible? And, and, and let's be honest, a lot of times uh, cheating can, can require more effort than actually doing the studying and the preparation for any assessment, right? Uh, students, I, I mean, I, I, I can imagine students go through numerous hurdles just to be able to cheat instead of study, which I can't fathom because it's easier to study and prepare for the exam sometimes than to cheat. But anyway, students do that and it works for maybe one test, maybe, maybe one class, but teachers are different. Classes are different. The material is different by different courses and different programs, right? So I want to see somebody with the intent to cheat, cheat their way through an entire degree. And um, if they're successfully able to do that, then I want to see them do it on the job. And if, you know, in absence of that, I want to see them do it through an advanced degree. I think very few people are going to be able to actually accomplish that because of how difficult material can be the higher you go, 
right? And then there's the whole point of of students um, whether or not they want to cheat, right? Because in the same town hall, Dr. Joyner mentions, and this is another direct quote. Dr. Joyner says, quote, students largely want integrity measures as long as they do not punish honest students through extra hurdles or false suspicion, and that they want the reputation of their degree and institution to be preserved. The, um, the quote that I, I want to focus on is, is the fact that students generally want the reputation of their degree and institution to be preserved. And obviously, that doesn't really apply to somebody who wants to uh, is a career cheater, right? They they have no care for reputation, and I guess they do care about reputation if they're willing to cheat through an entire degree. Um, but 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 they don't really they aren't really concerned about their own reputation or 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 you know whether or not that degree will will get them what they want in the future, given the fact that they cheated their way through it, right? So so. Uh, I guess, um, what do you what do you think about about what he says about um, the reputation of, of of a degree and and the institution and and wanting to preserve that and and therefore students are are inherently or at least predisposed to not cheat. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think, um, yeah, I definitely agree with it. I mean, there's a funny saying like. If you get an A minus at Harvard, you're stupid, um, and I think um, that speaks to a, a lot to what the institution has done, which is obviously grade inflation, right? So nobody, a lot of people do not take Harvard seriously when someone says that they have good grades at Harvard because it's like, okay, well everybody has good grades at Harvard, and I think the same would probably apply to to you know reputation um, of an institution, just like you know if. if for instance, um, another example is with the USC um, scandal, right? With the college scandals and um, with a bunch of, correct me if, I, if I'm wrong on this, but I believe um, the parents of some very wealthy children um, paid coaches as well as other university officials, um, basically bribing them and, and got their students into the schools. Um, Basically, even though they didn't have, even if they didn't have the merit to get into the school itself, they they were able to work their way around that by, you know, posting fake pictures of, of the students on, on like I think it was rowing was the sport. Yeah, they post like they posted they photoshopped pictures of of the kids' heads onto actual rowers and made it look like they had an actual like an actual um, student athlete profile, and then they were able to get into these universities recruited as student athletes and when the news broke about that um usc as well as a bunch of other schools were caught red-handed and um, well i wouldn't i shouldn't say the institution itself i should say it's really the people working at those institutions but nonetheless the the institution still got the bad rap because of that and a lot of people were like oh we always knew usc was like this you know spoiled children we all knew they were taking bribes anyway blah 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 and so the credibility of these institutions really went down at least for a while um i don't know if that's still the case today i'm, I'm sure that that now it's not as big of a deal as, as it was but you know just having your your university have that reputation of like oh my god like there are a bunch of cheaters here right and and you know anyone can pass at this university if they just cheat i don't think anybody wants their school to be seen like that because then that means their degree is worthless like that's that's pretty much what it translates into and um I think I definitely agree with, with his statement. Um, students inherently want their their institution and their degree to have actual value, and they don't want that credibility to be diminished. And so I don't think I don't think that they um, would compromise those two, you know, in order to get better grades or whatever through cheating. Um, I think students do care about integrity. Um, I don't know what your opinion on, on that is, but I think that. As, as a general rule, students do care about integrity. I think, I think I'm inclined to agree with you. I, I, I want to feel proud of my university. And whenever my university gets you know, good 
good press about their programs and and the things that they're doing and their accomplishment accomplishments I, I feel proud i feel happy that my university has a good reputation and if my university somehow gets tarnished by some bad press then i'm going to feel saddened by that because what does that mean for me even though i'm a graduate and i don't go there anymore what it means for me is that my degree in the eyes of other people the reputation has been tarnished right yeah. so so just by pure association of being a graduate at the university not necessarily being involved in the actual scandals of the university a hypothetical scandal right yeah not even being involved i might my, my reputation has been tarnished in the eyes of other people particularly employers or you know some people higher up that are looking at my degree right my reputation has been tarnished so I, I do care about the reputation of my degree and my institution, right? And, and, and if cheaters bring down that reputation, then I'm going to be hurt by that. I'm going to be affected negatively by that, right? So I, I feel like I'm inclined to agree with what Dr. Joyner says here. Now, I think, I think the first part of his statement is going to be a little bit more uh, polarizing, let's say, and and he says he hmm. says that students largely want integrity measures, as long as they do not punish honest students through extra hurdles or false suspicion. Now, this one makes me sort of turn my head a little bit because because students, um, I guess I guess what I'm trying to say is students have different uh tolerance levels i guess in terms of how many hurdles they want to jump through or jump over uh when it comes to integrity measures right some students are like yeah totally fine i don't cheat so in order to prove that i don't cheat i'm willing to walk over any hurdle you throw at me you want to record my camera fine you want to record my screen fine you know anything throw me anything and i will prove to you that i don't cheat but there are some other students who are more on the side of, oh, well, do you not trust me? I feel like I'm hurt because you don't trust me. I've been a good student thus far. I, I don't cheat, right? So why don't you trust me, right? So they feel like a trust has been broken uh, by these extra, you know, academic integrity hurdles and, and measures, right? And false suspicion is never fun because once you, once uh, somebody up in the food chain is suspicious of you for some misconduct, some act of misconduct. It's very difficult to sort of get that individual away from that bias and that view of your reputation, right? So false suspicion is never fun. I agree with that. But what he says, uh, he generalizes that students largely want integrity measures as long as they don't have to go through extra hurdles. And I'm not I'm not a hundred percent sure about that. So I want to hear your thoughts on 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 what he says on that matter. Yeah, so do you mean like just on on the fact that like on punishing honest students through extra hurdles or false suspicion? Do you mean just like what do yeah, I think those well, extra Yeah. Yeah, I I I wanna focus on the extra hurdles here because yeah. because mm -hmm. my point is that like some students are they they don't care how many hurdles they have to jump through. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. because it, it doesn't affect them. But other students are are more like, well, I shouldn't have to go through these extra hurdles because um, because I'm a good student. You, you should trust me. Yeah, I mean, I think extra hurdles to a point um, are okay, but I think there is a point where you start getting a, a little bit a little bit crazy. I mean, I think lockdown browsers. I generally think if like. In theory, if they worked 100% the way that we wanted them to, obviously they don't because, you know, students could just use a second screen or, or whatever. But, um, uh, you know, assuming that they did work 100% the way we wanted them to, I think they'd be okay, right? But then, like, you start getting into things like webcams, and then I'm like, okay, well, that may be a little bit more of an invasion of privacy. So I think there has to be, there has to be lines drawn. Um, I think that... This is a hard one because obviously, like, we don't want to assume the worst of our students, but at the same time, right, um, leaving le leaving any, like, holes uncovered can cause a lot of problems because then that's how, that's, that's, the, that's the one way that they're going to cheat, right? Like, 
Hmm. It's um. It's interesting. I don't know. Yeah, you you're right. It? it it is it is kind of a hard issue. I I, I yeah. agree. It's it's very gray. Yeah. But um. And, and I don't I don't mean to like. I don't mean to like go against you. Like I'm not arguing with you here, but I wanna I want you to humor me for a second. I, I wanna I want you to think about what's different about sitting in class and having the professor watch you or watch your desk and watch what you're doing and compare that against recording your webcam taking the exam. Like what's what's different about that? Because if you're going to use the the privacy argument, and, and I'm not I'm not trying to like reduce the privacy argument at all because I, I believe in privacy a lot. Like I, I do personally believe in individual privacy a lot. So I'm not trying to reduce that by no means. But I wanna th I want to to think critically when you when you use privacy as a a justification for not utilizing proctoring technologies like Respondus or ProctorTrack, which is what Georgia Tech uses, uh, or at least the OMSCS program uses, um, I want to think critically about that that privacy concern, right? Because when you're in a classroom or a lecture hall, you have TAs, you have the professors. Uh, some of them are staring over your shoulder. You know, they they say no talking, right? And they monitor you. They say no phones, right? If you, you know, some I've seen some professors say, "Oh, you need to go to the bathroom. Give me your phone." You know, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and and like, so so what's different about that and recording your webcam? Like, what do you think about that? It's a really good question. Um, I think number one, it's the environment you're in, right? Obviously, when you're in a lecture hall, you put yourself there. You're okay with that. You're like, okay, fine. I mean, I'm here to take a test, and that's all I'm here to do, and that's fine. But then you, you start getting into like, okay, well, now you have a, a webcam, but it's in the middle of your, your living room or your bedroom or wherever you're taking the test. Now it gets a little more invasive, right? Obviously, I'm not saying that like, you know, professors have malintent and they're going to, you know, look at, look into your entire room and invade your privacy. Like they don't want to do that. They just want to see if you're cheating or not. But that's number one. It's just the environment you're in, the circumstances, right? Number two, I think that a lot of students, the way they perceive it is um, there's a difference between being in a lecture hall where there are student, where there are TAs and, and, you know, professors occasionally looking to see if you're cheating or not versus a webcam which is there in front of you like the entire time that's like the equivalent of having one ta or one professor by your shoulder watching you take the test the entire time that's a little uncomfortable right like i'm sure that i would be uncomfortable if i was um if i was taking a test and there was just a professor looking at me the entire time like 100 percent of the time I, I would be okay with you know having you know a TA walk past like every minute or so and a you know, professor looking across the room making sure no one's on their phone but obviously when you have someone looking across your shoulder basically which is what the webcam is doing the entire time you're taking the test it's a little uncomfortable for for some people and I think that um, that's just like that that's just seen as an invasion of, of privacy for them um, I mean I personally don't have this concern because I never had to use but aside from that one practice test I never had to use um, the 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 webcam feature um or even a lockdown browser extensively but um i know for some people that that definitely was a concern yeah and and you know what i think you're right uh, uh, i i think i'm inclined to agree with you there the 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 discomfort of having or, or just the thought of having somebody watch you the entire time while you're taking a test does lead to some discomfort. And what does that discomfort do? It leads to distractions. You're not focusing on the exam and you're, you're going to do poorly or at least more poorly than, than you would otherwise. Right. And, and, and I think, I think there, there's an argument to be said about, about discomfort. Maybe, maybe privacy is more of a gray area. Maybe that's a little bit more up to debate, but, but definitely the discomfort factor needs to be factored into the exam, right? Because discomfort can throw any student off, you know? Um, but, uh, I, I mean, I have a lot of exposure to these proctoring tools in, um, I've actually had proctoring tools been used in class as well. And, and and the reason for that is because in, in the computer science degree, you know, you can't avoid taking exams 
on a computer sometimes, right? So, in my in my introductory computer science class, I had to do respondus lockdown, and and the professor recorded me even though I was in the lecture hall. I partially understood that. I actually, I actually, you know, I, I take that back. I fully understood that because it was a huge lecture hall. She was rather old, so so I I can't expect her to walk up the stairs up and down the entire hour and a half, even two hours during a final exam, right? So uh, using the webcam in that instance, I think is is justified. You're also in the lecture hall, so you know, like, and you're also taking an exam that's on the computer, and and she said that you're not allowed to access the internet or whatever. So, and uh, it's a it's a very popular class as well. So it, it's not feasible to ask the student to sort of sit two spaces away from another student or whatever. Every seat is basically filled at this point. So so the, the webcam I think is used to, as, a, as a scalable way to make sure that you're not conversing with other students during the exam. So I think that makes sense. And, and aside from that, I've had to use Respondus Lockdown in um, in uh, several other courses in my undergrad degree, I use ProctorTrack now in OMSCS and um, in in computer networks. All that was required for me was that the webcam was on, the screen was recording, and um, you know I, I was only allowed to have that one window. It was actually smart enough to detect that I had multiple monitors, so I only took it on my on my. Um, my single monitor. And I think Respondus Lockdown actually does lock against multiple monitors, given the professor actually enables that as a restriction. So um, so don't think that just because Respondus Lockdown like is bad, just, you know, it, it can actually detect that. Um, so anyway, um, in my class now, though, there is an additional layer to the academic integrity check, and that is um, you have to have a, a, a room scan or a desk scan. And that involves one of two scenarios. Either you grab your webcam and you rotate it around your room, particularly around the desk, under the desk, over the desk, above you, around you, to make sure that there aren't any resources on the table. Um, you know, you're not using multiple monitors. You don't have any notes hanging around and you don't have anybody in the room. Right, And then another way that you can do that is if you have a mirror, if you have a large mirror, you can put it in front of the webcam and sort of wave it around to sort of, uh, I guess, get the picture of your desk and, and below the desk and above the desk to, to demonstrate that you don't have anything, you don't have anything on your desk while you're taking the exam, right? And that's an additional layer. Um, and, and some students in OMSCS actually complain about that a lot, actually. It's, it's in the community, it's in the subreddit, if you search through it you get a bunch of complaints about uh, having to do a room scan. And that's a breach of privacy, even more of a breach of privacy because you actually have to show the entire room, right? So Yeah, so, that, sounds, so, that does sound pretty invasive, even more than the respondents lockdown because at least like with the webcam, you can focus it in just your face and mm -hmm. you know what's behind you. But like, yeah, that is, yeah. Pretty, that is pretty invasive, I'd say. I mean, that's just right. my opinion though, obviously. Right. Yeah. And, and, and I think I'm inclined to agree with you, though... It, I, I do understand the the reasoning behind needing a, a desk and room scan is is you know students given the opportunity will cheat and and I, I can totally understand professors that want to mitigate that possibility right and so while we're on the subject of of these proctoring tools I want to go over some other strategies that some other schools have taken. Um, and, and some of these I, I actually really do agree with and, and others uh, I'm a little questionable. There aren't, there aren't things that I, I disagree with like 100%. Um, I, 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 at most, I partially disagree um, with, with some of these, but, but in general, I do agree with a lot of these strategies. So, so that's a good thing. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is having more assessments to spread out the grade point distribution. So what I mean by that is imagine more tests that are weighted less instead of having one or two exams that are huge to the grade, right? Like, what do you think about that? Like, apparently the, the idea is that having more lightweight assessments can, um, can deter students from, from cheating. It's interesting, interesting point. Um, I'm not sure actually, I mean, Hmm. 
It depends on the type of like assessments and how the. I mean, I'm guessing those are all like open book sort of assessments, and they're like well, homework like assignments. don't even consider like the the open book. Like just like what's your opinion first of all on having mm-hmm. more assessments that are lighter weight than just a midterm and a final, and that's your grade. Yeah, I think I think those are definitely. Yeah, that's that's definitely a good idea. I think um, if you spread it out, then there's less pressure. Obviously, like um, Dr. Joyner said. A lot of cheating is due to is due to desperation, and um, yeah, I think uh, I think if you spread it out more, then there's less emphasis on on just one midterm or, or or like a few midterms and a final, and rather like students will try and and give their best effort for for each single assignment. Um, yeah, I think I think it's a good idea. Yeah, and I think I think it's a good idea too, and also. I, I feel like, I, I don't know if saying this is like in general what other high schools do, but I feel like when you're in high school, there are a lot of assignments that are graded, right? It's not just a midterm and a final. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, so you, you sort of go into college used to the idea of having multiple ways of being graded and you have multiple chances, right? <clears throat> so when when you go from, from that to like, Oh, only a midterm and only a final, and one is fifty percent, the other is fifty percent, and that's your grade. You know, yeah. you, you you bomb one, and that's it. You're you're done. Like your grade is decided, basically, right? That's tough. That's a lot of pressure, and the pressure, like you said, can add to the desperation factor, which can motivate some cheating. So, I I definitely one hundred percent agree with this strategy. So, are we in agreement? Like that strategy is a good is a good strategy. I think it is. Yeah, we should learn of course, from high school. <laughs> yeah, of course, this means more work for the instructor. The instructor has to create more exams. You have to grade more frequently, right? So there's additional overhead to the actual instructor. Sure. Um, but uh, but but what does that mean? That means you get less cheating, so your your data is cleaner. I feel like, and I think that's, I think that alone is uh is is beneficial enough to warrant the cost of creating more exams creating more quizzes and and grading in that time so i i 100 agree with this strategy now um w- we know this technology uh so 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 given that distance learning requires us to use a lot of technology instructors also use some technology to detect and deter against academic dishonesty, right? So one of which we're familiar with, that's Turnitin.com, right? Turnitin.com is a very, very popular, well-known website that checks for plagiarism and such like for for written assignments, right? We used it pretty much throughout all of high school um, and a university universities still use it to this day. And this is not a new technology. So, uh, so I think Turnitin is, is just fine, right? That's just, that's just a scalable, great way of checking for plagiarism because plagiarism, you really have no excuse at all, you know? Yep. So, yep. so I, I 100% agree with Turnitin.com. Like this is just simple. An- another, I, I guess this is more on computer science and software engineering, but there's this cool, there's this, ugh, there is this tool called MOS, which stands for measure of software similarity. Um, and I think, I think my school uses like Mars or something, or, or, or I think that might've just been Moss. Um, but, but basically it checks for code similarity between other students and other, uh, files uh, elsewhere. And, and that makes sense. That's basically a turnitin.com, but for code instead. Right. Um, so I, I 100% agree with that though, when it comes to implementing algorithms and you're following pseudocode that's a little bit more shaky because um a lot of these algorithms are pretty much well known and decided to be correct and efficient and so when you're implementing that uh you you tend to have the same approach as everybody else because you're following some established convention so sometimes you might be flagged for that but eh whatever i'm pretty sure the professor totally understands um you know if they're teaching this material they know that there are some established conventions so i think i don't think that's a major concern we've already talked at length about digital proctoring tools um so one strategy that i did not consider but i read this direct from uc berkeley because uc berkeley actually published a a web page detailing some some best practices that they've determined to deter against cheating and that is refraining from curving so, so UC Berkeley recommends to their instructors to not curve 
in order to to mitigate cheating. So, what do you think about that? Because I, I have never heard of refraining from curving before as a a, a, a misconduct mitigating Interesting. technique. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, none of my classes curve, but people still cheat. <laughs> so I don't know if that would do anything. Um, the The idea is that yeah. is that cheaters will get high grades, and the high grade will set the curve, and so therefore the honest students get punished for um uh you know the the honest students get punished as a result of cheaters cheating. Yeah, that's I mean, the idea. I don't believe in curving in the first place, so I think refraining from curving is a good thing um, in general and in this situation as well. <laughs> I mean, that's just my opinion, though. Yeah. All right. So, so moving on, um, the the other strategy is making exams entirely open book, and that that also includes open notes, open resources, whatever. And the yeah. idea behind this is that um, cheaters will the first thing that they look towards is oh access my notes i can pass this exam but if you say everybody gets to access their notes then you take that power away from them right you democratize it as opposed to making it one student one cheater being able to do that so so uh, i heard you said that you you <clears throat> am i correct in saying that you don't really like the open book open notes idea or or did i get that completely backwards in my head i think it works in some scenarios um, I think there's a time and a place. So, I, for instance, I think it works well for physics, and the reason why is because the the physics professors all make the test themselves, so there's no way to cheat using you know Chegg or course here or whatever. <clears throat> and also, the thing with physics is that even if you do have your notes, they give us like access to a bunch of formulas and stuff on 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 our you know on our exams. Like we we have those already, so having it be open no open book actually doesn't change anything the only thing the only thing that actually does change it is collaboration that's the one factor that changes the physics exams now so assuming there was actually no like way for you to communicate with anybody else i think it'd actually be perfectly okay to have the thing open book like i think it's totally fine the, the, obviously the problem is that people collaborate and not everybody is able to collaborate some people you know actually do do the test themselves while others take advantage of the resources and go ahead and text their friends. Um, but yeah, I think it's just that that's that's the problem I have with the everything is open book, everything is, you know, on the table. Um, I, I don't like that because I just think it's it it causes problems when it comes to, you know, getting answers um, from other people. And like I said, that that creates disadvantages for certain people because certain people maybe don't have friends that they can text and don't have study groups and they're on their own right whereas these other people um do have the resources so i don't know it's interesting but i i, I don't like this and i think it's because i think we need a, a more like nuance i guess more nuance approach to to the problem i don't think that this can work for every single class in every single situation i think it should be used with reservation Gotcha. Say. So, so what you disagree with is is that um, students are able to collaborate with other students, and therefore the open book, open notes thing sort of, um, yeah. it doesn't really do a good job at going quite as far to to yeah. uh, mitigate the cheating. Yeah, and, and I think you're right. I think you're right. Though I, I I do you do have to consider the open book, open notes thing does result in the reduction of the the privacy concerns because therefore there is That's no true. need for a room scan that is true and, yes. and truthfully speaking there is no need for the webcam though the webcam be, can be used as a mitigating factor for the collaboration thing that you just said yeah. but um but if you do allow the exam to be open notes open everything then then there's there's no need to scan the room really yeah to scan yeah. the desk so 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 that is a, a privacy plus if you if you think about it that way uh, and it's it's funny that you talk about collaboration because that's actually a, the other factor the the other thing mm -hmm. that uc berkeley recommends is for instructors to make exams or any sort of assessment collaborative by design so from the get-go make them collaborative as opposed to individual and, and obviously yeah. that, that doesn't really make sense for an exam, but maybe if you were assessed on, say, a project or a poster 
or you know anything of the sort right if you were collaborating in a group and your grade was de uh, was decided by a, a group um then then you you take all of that all of those concerns with the open book open notes concerns and, and the collaboration concerns you 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 open that up you just allow it by nature by design right what do you think about that now see now i like this idea right because you know when you have Let's say everything's on the table, open book and also collaboration. Everything 100% is on the table. Now it gets really interesting because then assuming that the professors are designing the test around these kind of parameters and saying, okay, I understand that students are going to have open books and open collaboration now. So let's say, for instance, like they make the the test question extremely hard, which is what they actually do. in um, there, there's a mechanical engineering course in at Hopkins. And all the exams are actually take home, open collaboration, open note, everything, right? You can do whatever, whatever the heck you want, as long as you finish it. Um, but the problems are extremely hard. Like they're ridiculously hard. And the professor does it for a reason because he knows that, you know, you have all your resources at, at hand and so you can use whatever you want. So he makes it really, really hard, even if you do have all these resources. So I think this can actually work. I think it's actually interesting. And encouraging collaboration um, in this case is actually, I think, very interesting. Um, I think it's a good thing. I think, um, I mean, it's what you do in real life anyway, right? Like, you know, we're engineers. We work in teams all the time. So I think this is a good thing. And I think it does replicate actually the real world. So, yeah, it's a good idea, I think, um, if done properly, of course. Yeah, and I think I agree with you. The only concern I have here is on the side of the instructor. This obviously adds a great, massive deal of overhead for the instructor, right? Oh, yeah, to, to grade and evaluate the kinds of assessments here and also to create something like this, right? To create an exam that accounts for the open book, open notes, there's no way you can, you can add a rote memorization question into the exam anymore. Like there's no way, because that's just a freebie basically. Yeah, no memorization. Right? Even like, I mean, you have you basically have to make it open ended to an extent, right? Like you can't right. even have it have one single answer. Like, yeah, you know, people have you have free response questions in physics, but they they ultimately have like one or two answers basically that yep. you can give. Um, and obviously, the thought process is going to be slightly different with you know with different people, but generally you're going to get the same answer. But for something like, for example, coding, right? I know um, for my for my MATLAB final. Um, it was really interesting because even though we had open collaboration, open book and everything, my, the way I solved problems and the way my, one of my friends solved problems was completely different. Like we had totally different code. So, um, and obviously there was like plagiarism checks. Like the professor said, no copying, you know, people's code, like word for word. You, can, you can't copy and paste, but you can like ask them for help and stuff like that. Right. Um, I thought that was, that's really interesting to do that for, for something like a CS course. Um, that I think that works because just because like the nature of the course is like okay it's kind of open-ended you have certain open-ended solutions and although there will be some things that are very similar um everybody's solution is going to be different so it's fine you know like having collaboration is totally fine um yeah i think i think that's i think that's a course where it can work but for certain courses like math or physics it's definitely going to be a lot harder i would say yeah some yeah. some subjects where where it's 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 definitely process oriented but still you 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 come down to a a, a final answer yeah this is this is harder to do because math yeah. the beauty of math is that it's not open-ended right so yeah, yeah. you you That's always true. come to an answer and and maybe 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 the steps to get there uh, can differ you know with integration you could do integration a million different ways but um you, you get to one answer right but yeah. but that can only go so far you know so i think in math this is more difficult to implement making exams collaborative and open book and open notes and whatever yeah um uh, but um that's uh, that's just the reality of the subject you know so there has there has to be more there have to be more creative ways to 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 um to mitigate cheating in, in, in those subjects. But I think I, I think I like this a lot, like making it a project or a, a poster or a video or or I guess even like a collaborative exam where the questions are really, really hard to sort of to sort of uh, I guess encourage discussion and collaboration. I think that that's great. And it's a it's a wonderful way to to assess students because that's just more uh, more reflective of, of the real world and, and the situations they're in.
right? Yeah, I mean, I, I think with engineering, with I think even humanities, it's it's easier to do this because with humanities, obviously, you just have papers, right? You don't have like multiple choice exams like you did in high school English or anything anymore. You just have straight up papers. So I think actually, the huma surprisingly, the humanities students were the ones who had the easiest transition, I want to say, to, to remote learning because they were doing the exact same thing they were doing before. The only difference was the lectures are a little different, but um, the, uh, the method of, of, of content delivery was different, but their assignments were exactly the same. They just, okay, well, you turn on the paper online, you turn it into Turnitin, so you can see if there's plagiarism or whatnot, and then, you know, it's just like it's an open-ended response. So, I mean, like, that's that's totally, that's totally, like, un uncheatable, pretty much, right? Like, with a, with, yeah. a, with a paper or a project, some sort of poster, even, like, uh, like a speech, for instance, right? Like I, I saw a, a few students actually giving speeches for their courses on Zoom, which I thought was really interesting. Um, funny how they, they managed to work that out logistically. But yeah, like that sort of stuff, you can't really quote unquote cheat on, right? Like a lot of engineering problems even. Um, I know that when I was in high school and we did um, projects for the Mesa program, I was judged on a rubric. It wasn't like, you know, one answer to like solve everything. You know, you, you don't have particularly one design. It's just anything that that fulfills all the criteria will work so yeah i think those sort of subjects this type of approach works perfectly for but obviously as you mentioned the more traditional subjects a lot more difficult but we live in a modern world so <laughs> yeah yeah and, and and you you, you actually i mean I, I would love to see somebody try to cheat a speech that, yeah that would be oh hilarious actually yeah yeah it would be i mean i don't know but, you can right can't you like can't you just look at like if it's a if it's in real life, obviously, like the professor can see if you're reading off a script, but in on a Zoom lecture, it might be a little harder, wouldn't it? Yeah, but but I mean, it's it's hard to like deliver a speech it, while true. you're cheating, right? That's I think true. the only I think the only feasible way that you'd be able to cheat a speech is if you had a twin. <laughs> Do you yeah, know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like yeah, you have yeah. a twin that is more. I guess inclined to public speaking, do the speech for you, right? And nobody would notice, right? Yeah. Um, but 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 while while you were talking about speeches, I actually brought up an idea. Like, what if you had, what if you presented the process, the steps that you took to do a math problem, and then the teacher asks questions about it? There's no way you'd be able to dodge the questions in a math exam as you're talking about it, right? If you if you mm -hmm. don't know, if you were copying, and then and then you had to present your steps and explain yourself, you wouldn't be. I don't think you would be able to go through that if you were cheating. It, it, at least it would be very, very difficult if you were cheating a yep. math exam where you had to speak about it. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, I think it would. So I guess to close out this episode, because it, now it's getting over, um, over we're, we're, pat, we're well beyond the, the hour point now. I guess the last, last moral question, last ethical question is, uh, is remote or distance learning more prone to cheating and dishonesty? And the reason why I ask this question is because there, um, there are a couple of notable universities that simply have honor codes and um, uh, very, very little mechanisms, mechanisms to, or I, I should say very few mechanisms to, to enact proctoring or monitoring um, uh, of any kind and observe no widespread cheating. And these universities are Princeton and Stanford. Now, actually, when I was doing this search, because I, I got I got that part from from UC Berkeley, I wasn't able to find anything on Princeton uh, specifically, but I was able to find a link to some recommendations for the faculty um, from Stanford. And and Stanford, if uh, I'll pull it up right now, but Stanford, what what they say is that uh, they're they're, they're, all exams, all take-home exams will be open book. Like they must be open book. So if exams are to be take-home, and I guess all exams are now, then they must be open book, right? That, that, is, that is the recommendation and, and I guess the mandate to instructors at Stanford. The other thing is that uh, there should be no time limitations to take-home exams. So, um, so uh, it says here in the honor code, um, quote, 
take home exams should not have a specific time limit less than the full period between the distribution of the examination and its due date. And this is because uh, under the honor code, their students are not uh, expected to report uh, their start and end times on take home exams. Right, and so uh, so therefore, take home exams um, should not have a specific time limit between, you know, getting the exam and turning it in, right? And and I think that's pretty cool, right? Um, the the other thing is that uh, uh, for labs and, and lab exams, they they uh, lab exams should be practical style in nature, right? So so there are lab practical exams. Um, with uh, core staff and faculty present in the room, right? But obviously that that doesn't really work now, considering uh, the, the the pandemic and such like. Um, but 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 and there are other points here too, which we'll link in the show notes. But the point is that there are universities out there, and Stanford is a very very notable one, that have only honor codes and very little in in the means of proctoring, and they really trust their students and. A, Apparently, according to UC Berkeley, they observe no wide, uh, no cases of widespread cheating. So, first of all, I want to hear your thoughts on that, and also I want you to give me an answer as to whether or not distance learning is more prone to cheating and academic dishonesty. Yeah, so I do think that I do think that remote distance or distance learning um, is more prone to cheating and dishonesty. I, I really do believe that um i just think it's more convenient for students to do it I, i'm not saying that they're doing like they're, you know they're planning it ahead of time like we mentioned earlier this is this is all due to you know pressure and stress and and, and whatnot so i do think that it is it is more prone to cheating and dishonesty um that's just because it's convenient for students and there's there's it's really difficult for for universities to actually monitor this sort of stuff so yes i think um I think there is more cheating and dishonesty. Um, and what was your second question again? Well, well, the the other part is I want to know your opinion on how Stanford and and, yeah, and yeah. other schools. Yeah, no, I think um, um, I think having everything be open book is probably the most reasonable thing to do. It's obviously not like the best. I do have my my gripes with it, um, but if you can do everything open book and make it, and I'll also allow collabor collaboration because honestly, there's no point of like saying that you're restricting collaboration i mean i think I just, I just think that's ridiculous like you can't stop kids from texting each other if you're gonna have it be open book anyway so might as well just open that up to have everything be on the table and just say okay well this is going to be open book open collaboration maybe we'll make the exam extra hard or something like that but yeah i think that's i think that's fair um i think what sanford is doing is is totally fair um that's just I think it's just it just accommodates for the circumstances, and I think that's the best solution to it. I don't know how else you could possibly do it. Yeah, and and I guess at the end of the day, there there is this is a transition period. Obviously, um, cheating is not a new idea, right? But but the fact that and and I, I think I, I will agree with you that that distance learning is uh, more prone to cheating, just because it's easier, right? The opportunity is there right yeah no one's gonna uh, catch you that's the thing it's like it's harder for, for yeah it's it's harder to be it's harder it's harder ugh, it's harder to detect and uh since it is harder to detect it's easier to to do yeah cheating yeah. right so i think given the opportunity students will take it uh you know it's it that's bad to say but but that's the reality um uh, I'm gonna th I'm gonna throw my own brother under the bus because I actually had a had a parent teacher conference with with his uh, <laughs> with his teacher and and his teacher was like I I caught him plagiarizing and I'm like, well, that's distance learning for you and that's third grade, <laughs> you know he doesn't really he doesn't really quite get that you know cheating and plagiarizing is not a good idea but you know he thinks that just because they're they're learning from home he can just copy and paste things which he wasn't able to do before in class obviously but um, you know students will do it. Given the opportunity and given the desperation, you've got a pandemic, which adds stress, which adds discomfort, and that can add to the desperation factor, right? As we just discussed at the beginning, um, and and that can push students over the edge of whether or not they should cheat, right? But uh, I I do think that I do admire 
Stanford for having this honor code and and having these recommendations to professors because one I I interpret it as Stanford trusts their students, right? You could not have gone into Stanford, well maybe uh, we know now that there are cases where parents pay certain people to get their students into college, but I I should hope in general students get in on their merits right so i think stanford students in general get into the university on their merits and therefore they they have earned the trust from the university to have these sort of measures right take home exams are inherently open notes by design and you know no time limits or or whatever right and and, and i i admire that I respect that. Obviously, students are going to take advantage of it. Students take advantage of everything these days. But I, I, I think, I think we see a trend here, right? The trend is that you restrict something. There are going to be students that that break that restriction. So, solution: don't restrict it. If you don't restrict it, you take away the opportunity to cheat. If you leave everything open ended, if you leave everything, um, you know, open resources, open collaboration, then then the cheating is obvious. If it does happen, right? Obviously, that's going to create more work for the instructor, but that's the price that you pay for wanting integrity, yeah. know, or or rather rather ensuring integrity. Everybody wants integrity, but but if you want to take steps to ensure academic integrity. You're gonna to have to take additional steps. Thank you for listening to the Study Space podcast. We know that there are countless podcasts being published every day, and you have decided to listen to ours in particular. It really means a lot to us that you've given your time to listen to two students ramble on about school. The show notes with links and everything we mentioned in the episode for further reading and learning are on our website at uniplan.dev. If you want to show support, share the podcast or tell a friend about it. Your testimonial to your friends and family is the most helpful thing you can do for us. We're on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. That's it for this one. We'll see you next time on the Study Space Podcast. <laughs>